Um, say hello to Joel and Giuliano on a talk on BMC firmware management. Um, hey, so thanks for joining us today. Um, this is a bit outside the Linux user space. <laughs> the, the basic talk is about how we actually manage a lot of hardware that enters the data center and the life cycle. And to do that, we built this toolbox, and that's what. I'm Joel Rebello. Um, I work at Booking.com with this guy. I'm Giuliano Martinez. Yeah. So uh, what we're trying to cover here is uh, there's, there's a bunch of challenges when dealing with bare metal at scale. Um, and this, this introduces like various problems that you try to solve with different kinds of software and the problems that you see with different vendors. And so uh, what we're talking about here is the base load management controller, uh, the toolbox that we built that tries to work with these controllers, and just some projects that we ended up building on top of the toolbox. Yep. Uh, so some of the challenges um, is that so nowadays booking is in a bit of a weird position. So we are not like a hard pay scale uh, like Google and Facebook, but we are also not a small company. So we have a huge number of servers, uh, but we we cannot just start using open compute. Uh, and we cannot stick to only one vendor. Uh, so we got in a weird position where uh, we had like four different vendors, about uh, 50,000 and growing count of uh, bare metal servers. Um, we would like to treat servers as, as light bulbs. Uh, so in the past, it wasn't like that. So people would treat uh, hardware as pets. So for them, it would be uh, pretty tricky to move between servers and so on. But we were able to move uh, past this, this point. Uh, we would like also to simplify the vendor validation and adop adoption, right? So as I mentioned, so we are growing. Sometimes we need to uh, validate a new vendor uh, and then to adopt. So how, how to define standards to know if the vendor, this vendor will be good enough uh, to work uh, with us? Um, how to inventorize this data, right? Uh, I will mention uh, a bit later, uh, but it gets, it gets interesting that sometimes because of network connectivity and so on, you might lose hardware inside of your data center. Um, reliably interact with the hardware. Uh, that's also interesting because when you have all of these vendors and a huge amount of hardware, uh, and you try to do IPMI, uh, sometimes it gets, uh, gets funny, right? So uh, rebooting a machine sounds really simple, but can get really complex. Um, and also reduce the, uh, the manual, manual intervention. So our, our team uh, to manage these uh, bare metal servers has five people. So if we just to access a BMC, right? So because it needs to load the interface, um, and if it's a chassis interface, it's a, it's a hardware that was developed like 11 years ago, so it won't be fast. So it can take like uh, 11, 15 minutes maybe uh, just to open and, and access. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, just to expand on like treat services light bulbs, the idea is that if something fails, we don't want to spend more than even 10 minutes looking at it because this is a lot of hardware. The failure rate of hardware, like in today's center, in the first year itself is 5%. So with that many servers, you have a lot of hardware failing. So if it fails, put it in the broken bucket, take care of it later. Yep. Um, a bit uh, to show how, how it works, right? So you receive a hardware. You need to inventorize it first. Then you keep, uh, while people are not using the hardware, you keep it always up to date to make sure that uh, when it goes to production, it has the latest firmware uh, and everything else. Uh, you install this machine. Uh, people use it. If they don't use this hardware anymore, or if it spend more than X days uh, running in production, it should be uh, sent back to, to be repurposed. And after three to five years, we would like to retire this hardware. So this is how uh, it works, the life cycle of the hardware for us. Yeah, so that kind of covers the challenges. I, I hope that gives you like an idea of the environment and the kind of problems we see uh, when dealing with this kind of hardware. So the next up, we're going to talk about the baseboard management controller. Um, 
So the idea with the base load management controller is it like sits alongside your server, right? Or or your JBoard or JBOFO. Um, this data center hardware it provides out of band access. Uh, and you've probably heard of this a lot lately in the news. Um, the chipset there is what um, like a lot of vendors use, like Supermicro and Quanta. It's an AST. Uh, all of them like use uh, software development kits provided by ASSpeed, which is then um, modified to display like their own logo. And, but uh, essentially, this is like a software on a chip that has on a single die the flash and VGA uh, video graphics um, controller, and then it has access to all of these PCI devices over the South Bridge, and it can also interface with the, the NIC itself and send packets by itself. And uh, because it has like this access to all of these components, you, uh, when the machine itself is not responding over maybe the data network, you, through the out-of-band connection, you can actually um, do a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, yeah, and since it has access to all of this hardware, you can also inventorize the hardware, uh, the, whatever is on, on the server itself. And you can trigger various hardware actions like in, as a last resort for things. Yeah, and, and how to access uh, this thing, right? So we have a PMI that uh, it's kind of common across all the vendors. Um, and a PMI, so it has evolved over time, but not much. Um, so if you go and you check, uh, for instance, the IPMI2 command, uh, the source code, uh, it's pretty interesting. And for a lot of things, it needs to do magic, right? Because although it's a standard, uh, it doesn't mean that vendors will follow it properly, right? And a lot of things that you need to get data uh, via PMI, there will be raw commands, right? So and then it gets uh, a bit weird that you need to know uh, all the raw commands to get information for specific things for every single vendor. There, is, there are other issues with APMI, uh, and I hope that in the future uh, we don't need to use anymore. Uh, that's the hope with Redfish. I'll talk about it later. Uh, there is SSH, uh, which is better for a lot, of case, a lot of cases, but there are some actions that, for instance, if you are using UFI uh, with a specific vendor, and you trigger PXE and reboot through smash CLP that the SSH, it won't work. So you need to use IPMI. Um, there is the web interface, as I mentioned. So there are, there are different uh, versions uh, and vendors and generations, right? So now it's getting better and better. But if you think that the hardware life cycle is like from three to five years, uh, we always need to manage things that are not as awesome uh, and deal with uh, buggy and slow uh, hardware uh, from the past. Uh, there's Redfish, that's the future, but not just yet. So it's much better than when we started BMC Lib. BMC Lib actually started using Redfish, and then we decided not to use it for now. Uh, because it wasn't really uh, adopted by the vendors. And there is the undocumented APIs that we use it a lot. So for instance, the same APIs that are called by the web interface, uh, we ended up using these APIs to retrieve data, right? Uh, yep. And about the BMC2 box, right? Uh, the library and tools. So the library. Uh, so what, what we decided to do is that we started with Redfish, and it was nice and so on, and one vendor had support for almost everything. But then we couldn't get the license of the BMC of this vendor. And then we saw that on the uh, Redfish spec, there was a definition for licensing. Okay, cool, so then we can actually fall back this part. And then we check another vendor. Okay, so and then this vendor doesn't expose the host name. Um, but okay, cool. So then, so the host name I will fall back to the uh, to the old APIs. Cool. So now I'm retrieving the network interfaces. Oh, this vendor doesn't support the network interfaces yet. And then okay, cool. So then Redfish it will be a thing, um, but at least one year and a half ago, 
uh, it wasn't there. So then what, what, what we decided, so let's, let's uh, make a library. There, we'll use the best available uh, connection method to do what you need. And we will ensure that regardless of the, the vendor that you call, uh, the behavior will be the same. Uh, because for instance, some vendors you need to reboot and PXC, and others you need to PXC and reboot. Uh, but then we ensure that when you ask something like that, we do it in the proper way so, uh, so that it works. Um, so this is an interface, right? So we have uh, different providers uh, for, for each interface. So when we want to integrate a vendor, uh, this, will be, uh, this will be a common interface that we will use. So for instance, for the BMC interface, we have configure, we have BMC collection, uh, and here we have PXC once, right? So how, how does the providers look like? So these are the ones that uh, we have in our master branch. So we have like Supermicro X, uh, we have a dummy provider uh, for tests, uh, we have ILO, uh, we have iDirect9, iDirect8, and for CMC, that the chassis management controller, we have for M1000E and C7000. Um, this is also interesting because sometimes if you are using a chassis, it's much more interesting to trigger actions through the chassis than the BMC itself uh, because they become more reliable. So uh, things, uh, if you need to, uh, if you are using uh, pizza boxes, uh, the way for you to remove machines from, uh, from the power is that you need to go there and plug the machine, right? If you have a chassis, you can actually do um, a virtual uh, power receipt. So you actually remove the power and put it back on. Uh, and this is actually get, uh, pretty interesting uh, for us. So here's an example of PXC once with iDirect9. So with iDirect, we saw that we can actually uh, use the, the SSH, and it works all the time. So what we do is that uh, we issue an SSH login, uh, we connect to the iDRAC, we, should, we issue the command to, uh, to set the PXC, and then um, we put it on, and if everything works, we power cycle, and then this machine will work boot properly, right? And then with HP. Uh, so with HP, we saw that uh, if you're using UFI uh, with um, Gen 9 servers, it actually, you cannot, you cannot use uh, the SSH. And there is a bug also that, um, what happens is that you cannot just PXC and power cycle the machine because it will fail. So you need to power on. The power on, power on action will fail but if you don't do it, it won't work, um, right? So then, so actually, so this, this type of things, uh, what we did is that uh, we encapsulated that so that you don't need to deal with that. So we used to have a code base uh, in, as part of our CMDB that would need to know all of these things, right? And it doesn't make sense to have it as part of the CMDB. Yeah, no, um, so the other a uh, bunch of functions that are available in the BNC interface is the configure uh, actions. The configure actions are actually used to um, manage configuration on the BMCs. Uh, so why would you really want to do this, right? Uh, well, mainly passwords. So we had machines. We had machines that were running for like a long time with 10-year-old passwords, and uh, also like accessing the BMC interface itself is uh, it doesn't have a certificate, and so it's it's not trivial to have all of this uh, done in a standardized way across multiple vendors. So okay, so let's have this in interface that you declare a bunch of functions that should be implemented per vendor. Um, so for example, like this one is the ILO or the HP hardware. Uh, essentially, you can generate a CSR on the on the device, that is the BMC, and uh, you sign that certificate, and then you upload it back onto the BMC. So in HP, it's, it's very simple. You just fetch the CSR and you uh, post the, the end, uh, resulting uh, signed certificate. But with Supermicro, it's different, because Supermicro actually does not support 
generating a CSR on the device. You have to um, generate the CSR yourself, sign it, and then upload. Um, so the whole idea with this, these examples are that basically that we encapsulate all of these different differences into these functions, and yeah, you don't have to worry about them. Yeah, and what do we support currently, right? So uh, BMC Lib support uh, data collection uh, for Dell, HP, and Supermicro. Uh, ILO 3, actually, I would like to remove it uh, because uh, it's too old, and we don't have this hardware anymore, uh, but it's, it's there. Uh, and for configuration support, uh, we also we, uh, we do it across all of them. Yeah, and uh, with some of the Redfish support, uh, this will extend to most of PMCs, but yeah, yes. at some point. Uh, the tools. So after we built the BMC library, the idea came uh, of building tools uh, with these things, right? Uh, so the first tool, actually, so the, the tool that inspired BMC uh, library, it's Dora. At the time, it was called Thermalnator. So it was a tool to collect thermal and power data from, uh, from the data center to understand how much uh, heat we were generating across machines. And then from that, we saw, okay, so this is actually interesting, right? So if we can collect that, what else can, can we know, right? And if you look at the payload, right, so uh, there are some, some interesting stuff. There we have, we have like some uh, faulty slots. So it means that when Dora connects to a chassis and tries to read the information, if we have blades inside of the chassis that are failing, we will have an array with the number of the slot. So then for our data center operation team, uh, they don't need to keep searching for things inside of the data center. They have a list with everything that should be fixed. So this also collects the information about uh, the blades, funds, NICs, uh, PSUs, and storage blades that we have there, right? So then it actually it summarizes issues. Uh, things that we know as well, right? So for instance, it has a status. So you shouldn't try to provision a machine if you know that this machine is broken, right? Because it means that it will generate toil for us. Uh, then we can use the, uh, the status information from Dora to know if this hardware is usable or not. Um, another thing that it helped us, so imagine that uh, depending on how your uh, cabling is done at the data center, uh, for us is that uh, we have two interfaces, right? So one for data and an another one for out of band to make sure that these things are isolated. And we have a chassis, so the chassis receives one cable from the out of band and it spreads uh, on 16 uh, connections for every single BMC that we have. So the, the BMC is always reliable. So we know that if uh, the BMC connection is there, we'll be able to collect information about this machine. Uh, and after we deployed Dora, we found out uh, like old hardware that has been bought in like quite a few years back. And there was like wrongly cabling on data and this hardware was, uh, was missing in the data center. So this also helped to generate uh, like a dynamic inventory of what you bought and what you should have received. So now we use also that information to know that uh, the deliveries that we get from vendors are actually the things that we are buying. Yeah. Also that Dora is able to scan the whole data center in yes. like a few seconds. Yeah. So and, and the, the other thing is that we used to have a similar process, but this process would take a week to scan the data center. After we moved to Dora, uh, it started taking, uh, taking six, sec uh, six minutes. Uh, so it's much faster. And then, because some, some vendors are slow and so on, nowadays we can do it in 24 minutes. But it's like 24 minutes, we scan uh, about 50,000 assets. Yeah, uh, the other tool that is part of the BMC toolbox is BMC Butler. Uh, the idea was that this will be like a tool focused on just configuration for BMCs, like I mentioned earlier. But in, in this case, it essentially just retrieves data from the inventory that is a dollar and uh, starts to attempt to configure those BMCs. So in this way, we are able to like try to maintain a consistent state across all uh, baseboard management controllers. 
uh, and it can do a whole bunch of thing, uh, configuration um, like you saw in the interface itself. Yeah. Usually, in, it's not that you cannot configure BMC, but if, if you think about the installation lifecycle, what you would do is that every time that these machine probes are installing the, the first time, you will set out the configs, right? And then imagine that uh, you need to update the C name for your uh, syslog server, uh, or even you would like to change the password. Uh, to move it backwards uh, becomes tricky uh, with every single vendor. Uh, now with Butler, it becomes uh, also much simpler. <coughs> Uh, another tool that uh, we built on top of it, uh, it's Actor. Um, so the idea of Actor is to be able to trigger uh, actions across these uh, BMCs and CMCs. So if you want to, uh, to PXC a machine, so instead of using uh, IPMI uh, or calling BMC directly, Actor is posed an API, uh, pretty simple, that you send a payload telling what you want to do. And for instance, if you would like to do a sleep, right? So you want to power cycle, sleep for 30 minutes, and power cycle again. You can actually send this as a job, and we'll take care of it. Another uh, useful thing that it can do for you is to take screenshots, right? So if you want to take a screenshot of the BMC uh, to understand what the state of that machine, uh, it, it can do that for you. Yep, so uh, we covered the tools and the controller itself. And this is just something that we want to share that we did in the hackathon. Uh, it was an interesting idea, so you guys might find it. Uh, so you saw this picture earlier, but basically it's the machine lifecycle, right? You have a machine transitioning between these states, and you want to make sure that this transition is actually successful or you want to know that if the transition was not successful, which state the machine is in. And we're talking about 50,000 machines here, like, and we reboot or install 100 or 200 a day. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, our flow to install machines is that now uh, we are in a process of make sh making sure that machines can only live three weeks. Uh, so sometimes we have like from uh, 200 to 1,000 and uh, to 1,500 machines being reinstalled. And reboot actions, uh, it, it, it's a lot because, yeah, so hardware is not reliable. So one thing that you do a lot uh, is reboot machines. Uh, so, so the idea was that could we get, grab the screenshots and try to classify uh, what state the machine is in? Um, because to, like a sysadmin, I can look at that screen and I know that that is the, the BIOS screen. And when we update firmware on these boxes, they would, uh, a lot of them would get stuck. Like that, that Dell screen there is it being stuck on that. So it takes a lot of time to like, look at each box and why. So can we automate this, right? Uh, so oh, if you go back. Uh, so there's like different stages. There's the OS install, like you could probably identify that. For the CentOS OS install, there's also like the uh, there's a Pixie Boot sc screen there, and there's a Grub screen. So these are all different stages the boxes would fail in. Uh, so we we grabbed all of these screenshots and tagged them, and uh, basically we trained this model uh, completely. Like you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but here, let's try it. <laughs> uh, and uh, oddly enough. Uh, so we got actor to like grab the screenshot, uh, run it through uh, this train model, uh, and then give us a probability of what, where this machine is stuck in, or what is it stuck in. And uh, it was quite successful. Like there was a 97% success rate across like uh, close to 200 different checks that we did. So that that was quite high, and uh, it was just fun to build this. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. it, it's interesting because at the beginning, we, we didn't believe that it would work that well. Uh, but it, it, it predict, predicted a lot, right? So it actually, so if you think that 20 minutes, so if you, if you can, uh, so if like 12 or 15 of these get stuck during the day, so if you cut 9, 7%, oh, it's a lot of time that we can actually do something interesting. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's... Cool. 
And what are the next steps for, uh, for BMC Toolbox? So one thing that uh, we would like to do, so now we have a lot of API serv and services, right? But um, these work for us. Um, but if people want to use that, um, it's, it's not grumblesome, but it's a bit difficult, right? Because you have all these, uh, these different components that you will need to understand every single one of them to start using. So what we want to do is actually create a, um, a CLI that allows you to interact with all of the services. Then it becomes easier uh, uh, to use. Also, it's the same thing for the front end. Right. Uh, so one thing that's useful is that if you want to generate a report of the number of machines that you have with faulty PSUs, or the number of machines that you see that have odd number of memory, right? So this is an easy one to to see that you have uh, a fader, right? So if you have odd uh, odd an odd number of memory. It's very likely that there is one socket or one die that's failing, right? Uh, and also integrate Redfish for uh, generic vendor support uh, using Goldfish. So we started working on, on Goldfish. So this is actually a pretty nice uh, uh, Go library. Um, actually, it was the best one and the first uh, for Go uh, that can parse uh, decently all data format. Um, and we implemented uh, a lot of the features that are missing. Uh, so we what we will do is that we will have a generic driver for uh, for BMC Lib, but it doesn't mean that it's going to work across all of the vendors. So, for instance, to give an idea, right? So when you go to uh, to the Y Direct Eight, uh, the Redfish version that's there is V one zero two. So with this version, you cannot collect. Uh, disks inside of a machine, for instance. OK, so then for this type of hardware, we cannot, we cannot use Redfish, right? Um, for a Direct 9, it's a bit better. Um, and it can actually tell you if your uh, link of the data network is on or off. So it's more useful. But it also has some missing bits. Um, same thing with ILO, Supermicro, Quanta, and so on. One thing that happens is that I think as soon as vendors evolve and start to use more Redfish, it will become like a, a default standard. Uh, but it's, I think that we will need to keep the drivers for all the other vendors uh, forever. Um, the, the cycle at which hardware vendors release hardware versus DMTF releasing Redfish specs is different, like you get specs more often, and uh, hardware vendors take a long time to implement that spec. So they are basically behind all the time. And uh, they are also making mistakes in the implementation or implementing it incorrectly. Um, so hopefully we get to a stage where there's constant, some constant in all of them, and yeah. then it's usable. Yeah, but what we will do is that every time that we integrate someone, so if something doesn't work with the generic Redfish, we will have a way to, uh, to retrieve or set this information as required. So this is a good example with the certificate management. Um, and not every single vendor supports that, uh, but we can always do it through the, uh, through the APIs that they call on the web interface. Yep. And how can you help, right? So it's open source. Please use review, uh, submit re bug reports. Um, if you have vendors or hardware that you use and you'd like to contribute, it's actually it's, uh, not difficult. Uh, if you follow the interface, uh, there are tests to help you uh, to understand. Uh, and we are there to help as well. And get in touch if you are uh, if you work with Ironic, Mass, or just a bunch of bare metal servers. Yeah, uh, so we've looked at some of the implementations that Ironic and Mass and uh, these guys use to interface with BMCs, and they, even Foreman itself, uh, they have a redfish.py, and then it's just calling an IPML command, or it's doing uh, a redfish call. But essentially, there is a lot of context that is involved when you're interacting with BMCs if you want your action to be successful. And 
that's why I think that it makes sense to have a separate library for this. Yeah, and a summary, right? So wh why we started with the BMC2 box, right? And what the message that we, we want to pass. So the idea is to simplify management and uh, adoption of uh, multi-vendor hardware, ensure that you have the same behavior and state through provided interfaces, uh, reduce the bare metal uh, troubleshooting time, uh, more reliable bare metal interaction, and single view of hardware health across your fleet. Yeah, there's one tool which we didn't mention here is uh, we have something known as BMC FW update. Uh, we've not completely tested it in all hardware. We do use it internally, yeah. but uh, because we need more feedback, and the only way you can actually test firmware updates is by having access to the hardware. So, uh, if you if there's people interested, then have a look at the toolbox. There's there's a link. Uh, and maybe give us your input on, on that, yeah. So yeah, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thanks guys. It's on. So I developed some stuff in Iron regarding this. I spent like two years doing this and I was like a, a, a disaster after this. So yep. I had one very specific use case which was driving me crazy. So I had 30,000 super micro boxes and it wasn't X10. And yep. what was happening in my case, throwing random numbers around up from 10 to 20 percent of the BMC controllers were just going down randomly when issuing a lot of commands into them. Because all the stuff I was doing to go through this workflow, it was using purely IPMI tool, so no SSH, no anything more fancy. Yep. And then, you know, you have a workflow which issues 10 IPMI tool commands. After the second one, the BMC just dies in the box. And oh, yeah. it, this is something so fundamental that once it dies, you cannot revive it without going there physically, sending someone physically. Yeah. And, you know, if yeah. you have 10 boxes, it's pretty easy. But if 10% of, out of your 30 or 50K fleet starts behaving like that, what do you do? What, what do you do in your scenario, in your setup? Because I never found a solution for this. And for me, I still keep this vendor on the list, you know, kind of, if I can decide not to buy them, I yeah. will not. Yeah. So uh, vendor hardware, yes, there is like bugs all over the place. We found some, you send packets to HP ILOs and they would just drop off the network completely. So this, um, it's kind of tricky to say that uh, which vendor you should pick because essentially all of them have bugs. And this tooling tries to abstract away those issues. Um, but with Supermicro, I think with most vendors, you, you need to like have this constant relationship with them where you give them feedback and try to get that sh stuff fixed. And you, So some vendors have been trying to use our toolbox to validate uh, information they provide through the BMC. So instead of them giving us the tools, maybe we build the tools and we tell them to use this because it's more standard. Uh, but I don't think I answer your question of like which vendor you should pick and that's yeah. But, Maybe. but one that's also more of a fact because this whole library is so the library in most of the code I guess it just a set of random rules how to behave yes. having a specific vendor. Yep. Yep. Do you think we as a community of people doing exactly this stuff from that side, so not from the vendor side? have some means to impose more standardization of vendors. Because they do not care at all that APMI should be standardized. They all do whatever they want, yep. and they, they are in this position, ah, whatever happens anyway, you have to buy us. Yep. So, so can so we do something so they start behaving in a more mature way? Yeah. This, yep. this is what we are, we are trying to do with the relationship with them. It's always feedback about the issues and so on. But if, uh, as you said, right, so if you check the code uh, from IPMI2, you see that uh, it's tricky because there are some things that it's fixed in the code because it's easier. So this is how we do as well. So we keep reporting bugs and a lot of them get fixed. But for instance, their release cycle is like three, six months, 
right? So you're not going to wait like six months uh, for the bug to get fixed, right? Okay. So you need to keep installing these machines. So what we do is that we create the workaround and make it work. As soon as we get the, uh, the fix, we change the behavior. Uh, but I think that keep feeding back this information uh, is essential, right? Yeah. Because if they don't know, they, they won't fix it. Yeah, oh, um, so if you buy a lot of hardware, you have influence on uh, who you're dealing with and how you, what, what you're negotiating for. And this is what we see when we have meetings with our vendors. We bring all of this up all of the bugs that we faced. And then that kind of gets them to like get rolling and fix all of these things and then, yeah. Yeah, but it's tricky. Yep. Hi, I'm Ed from Packet. We have a lot of bare metal hardware, so this is near and dear to my heart. We've been working one level down uh, in replacing the BMC software with tools like OpenBMC. Have you met with that community to figure out how your tool set can validate their work and vice versa? And if not, let's talk about it. Yes, so uh, we actually, so we were, uh, we were doing a proof of concept with, uh, with OCP. And one of the things that uh, we would like very much is actually to, uh, to be able to contribute to OpenBMC because uh, we wouldn't need to wait for people to fix the bugs, right? We couldn't fix, so we could fix them ourselves. Um, but because of the number, so we are not, we are not as big uh, to start buying these things, right? So uh, we are not building data centers. So we have, um, we rent space, but it's not designed uh, for this type of hardware. So there are constraints, right? Like for instance, so during our tests, we, we try to, um, uh, to put a rack and it was too heavy. Uh, it, it wouldn't pass through the door. So with the hardware that we can actually use OpenBMC, and we would be more than happy to use it um, because uh, we can manage that and in, in our domain. Um, but for some of the hardware, we are not able to do that. Yeah, just as yeah. a follow up, the other piece of things we're working on is a project called Open19, which takes a lot of the ideas from OCP, but puts them in a standard 19 inch rack format, which by design fits in the same sort of rented data center space that we have access to, that you have access to the world of standard data center shape stuff, not yeah. pur purpose built data centers. So we'll talk afterwards. Awesome. Yeah. Um, to answer one of your, the first question was that, um, so are we integrating with OpenBMC? Is, uh, what I saw is OpenBMC is implementing Redfish um, as a service. So, depending on which spec they implement, we will have support for that. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to iterate. I think you spend so much time uh, working around the box of the uh, vendor firmware, one should really push to get OpenBMC. And if you buy a lot of servers and you have so much power um, to, that the vendors already um, talk to you, that they fix firmware bugs, I think you everybody who buys service here should, in the request for offers, should put in there that they want OpenBMC or UBMC. Because in the end, the, as you said, the, the BMC is a, a fully-fledged operating system, and actually it's better to standardize it also. And um, I know Facebook with their open um, compute stuff, they, I, I think they actually run CentOS on the BMC and then they can use all their tools and um, use this um, quite normally. So, yeah, we, we should all put pressure on the vendors yep, because there's no reason to have different um, BMC firmwares at all. I agree. Hey. So uh, just last week I was looking at another uh, library for um, managing Redfish. It's called Go Redfish from uh, Nordics, which is some kind of open source foundation. So take a look at that. It looks cleaner than uh, GoFish. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I have a question about uh, screenshots. So h how do you take a screenshot out of band? I know you can take a ser a serial uh, over LAN, but not, not the graphics. Or yeah. how do you? Yeah. So. Um, so the vendors expose an API which they use to show the screen preview on their BMC's uh, interface. 
So it's a vendor specific. Yes. Yes. It's all vendor specific, yeah. and so because we have BMC Lib, we can abstract. Yeah. It. So this is so. For instance, right? So if if you look at the code of BMC Lib, because we couldn't get these things uh, through Redfish, right? So then uh, we reverse engineer, right? So so when you open this page, so how does this get this is screenshot where it comes from? Oh, yeah. this is same point. Okay, cool. So then, and then you see that oh, actually to retrieve this type of hardware, I need to set these X uh, headers. Okay, cool. So we we do that. So with newer generations uh, and talking with the vendors, things get better. But everything that's old, uh, they they won't fix, uh, right? So for instance, yeah. so there is there is another thing that we had to implement because we would we would like to use LDAP. But if you just check LDAP configuration across all these vendors, it's a nightmare. So it's actually it's simpler to have a proxy, right? So you, you make the BMC call your LDAP proxy and you do what should be done properly because uh, your life's going to be easier. And this is what we did. Um, some, the, some of them don't even implement LDAP tree, right? So it's a software that was written like 12 years ago. So how uh, they, they say, so this thing, uh, it go, it's going end of life next year, so we can we can make it better in the next one, but this one uh, we cannot fix. Yeah, yeah. And maybe we should request uh, the Redfish to have the option of requesting a snapshot, a yeah. screenshot from the BMC. Yeah. So I, I think I've seen it in uh, the OEM section for HPs. So I don't know if all of the other vendors. Yeah. Should be standard. Yeah. yeah. That would be the, nice. the same thing with the license. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you.